I'm delighted to see so many of you here. Um, delighted to also see the diversity of uh, people in the audience. So I'm coming from a power electronics background. I will assume none of that background in this talk, although the talk will throw up a lot of stuff that will probably uh, look like power electronics. I'll try and explain it in simple terms. Um, as Sally mentioned, I'm gonna talk about dynamic wireless charging of electric vehicles. And Sally is certainly more bullish on, on this, um, but I will also try and convince you that the future of road transportation could very well be transformed if we had dynamic wireless charging. Uh, and the reason is that the three big themes in transportation or road transportation today are electrification, automation, and ride sharing. And all three of them can benefit tremendously from dynamic wireless charging. And I'll go through all of those in a minute, but let's just to kind of give you the summary. Um, one of the big hurdles for electric vehicles in terms of penetration has been associated with their energy storage, which is basically batteries. Um, and we will see how we could potentially reduce that um, roadblock by dynamic charging. Also, the other aspect that kind of puts people off from electric vehicles is that you have to go and remember to charge it. Uh, and if you want an autonomous vehicle, you certainly don't want it to be autonomous all the time, except when it needs food uh, or charge. And so to be truly autonomous, it needs to be able to charge itself, which is also going to be enabled by the technology I'm gonna talk about. And then finally, if you want to reduce the amount of traffic on the roadways, you wanna reduce essentially the number of vehicles on the road. And so if we had vehicles which really didn't have to go off and wait few hours to get charged and they were running all the time picking up passengers essentially doing autonomous full-time ride sharing uh, we'd be able to bring the amount of traffic on our roadway down as well so hopefully i'll convince you that all three of those can happen if we had really good dynamic wireless charging capability all right so let's just back up and kind of see uh, why we're even here and why we're talking about this subject um, I remember when I was an undergrad at Caltech, I was there for the first quarter, uh, maybe first half of the first quarter before we got a little bit of rain and I realized that actually Pasadena has mountains close by um, because you couldn't really see anything in the smog back in the 1980s. Um, things have obviously cleared up quite a bit, but if you go to Beijing, uh, it's probably more like this. Certainly Lahore is like that uh, when we have our advisory board meeting um, Sometimes the planes can't land because of the, uh, the, the smog, although they may claim it's fog, it's actually really smog because you look up, it's all brown, it's not even white. Um, and so if you could pair transportation, which is driven by uh, electricity with renewable sources of electricity, which is completely separate topic, and I'm not gonna dive into that. I think there's lots of lots of interesting possibilities and challenges there. Uh, you could really go to an environment which looks clean and nice. Um, and transportation, by the way, is the second largest creator of greenhouse gases in at least the US. It's about 22%, and this is just road, road transportation. I think transportation as a whole is even larger. It's like 27%, um, and electricity production only sort of beats it by another percent or so. So it would be a sort of a, a tremendous uh, benefit to society if we could actually convert into this kind of uh, environment. Well, um, let's kind of dig one layer deeper and see what are the real um, pros and cons of electric vehicles. So the thing that makes electric vehicles very cool and good is the fact that we can, one, certainly move the, uh, the fact that we're no longer burning gasoline in the engine sort of uh, further away. Uh, and hopefully that will all kind of get mitigated when we have renewable energy. But even if you were to be you were to produce electricity through sort of burning hydrocarbons, the electric motor is so much more efficient than the internal combustion engine that you end up having a wells to wheel benefit in overall energy uh, efficiency. Now, where electric vehicles are really essentially beaten out and they slam the brakes on you is essentially the fact that the energy density of even the best lithium ion batteries we have today is roughly two orders of magnitude below that of gasoline. And so if you're going to um, 
drive long distances, or if you're going to have to pump the uh, amount of energy you will need in order to go that long distance, you're gonna be essentially waiting a long time, or you're essentially not gonna have any space in the trunk for uh, any of your luggage. Uh, not to mention the, the batteries are still expensive, and so you also then pay for all of that uh, from your pocket. So the bottom line of all of that is that even though we see a lot of Teslas out on the roads, um, it's essentially mostly a New York and California event, um, and our total sales of electric vehicles is of the order of 2%. This, these are numbers from last year, I believe the numbers have gone up a bit this year. So Tesla, I think, has sold like 350,000 vehicles this year um, or, or thereabouts. So we are creeping up, but it's nowhere close to where we'd want to be. Um, and so the first thing that I'm going to talk about is that with dynamic wireless charging, you could potentially move these batteries out of the vehicle and leave just a small amount of, of of batteries that allows you to get to the roadway which has the dynamic charging capability. Now let me also kind of explain what dynamic uh, charging is um, before I kind of get to history. It's essentially the ability for us to deliver energy to the vehicle as it's moving. Right? Um, and I'll talk about different ways in which we can do that. All right, so before we um, hit the road in terms of figuring out what today's technology is, let's just sort of go back 100 years and actually realize that this is not new stuff. This is stuff that Nikola Tesla, uh, more than 100 years ago, gave a demonstration of at Columbia University. This is actually a newspaper or, or, or maybe even on, uh, some journal uh, drawing of some reporter who was there at the event when Nikola showing essentially a tube light lighting up when he had a couple of plates um, on either side, but nothing, no wires connected, and he was able to light up the, that tube light. Um, around the same time in France, um, Hutton and LeBlanc actually developed a system to transfer energy from the rail tracks or, or from the tram tracks into a tram, essentially using a transformer, but it was very loosely coupled transformer, so you have one coil in, in, the, uh, in the ground, another one which is a pickup um, on the tram itself, um, and that could be used to sort of drive the tram. Uh, it didn't really make, uh, make it into the real uh, world, but people were already thinking about it more than 100 years ago. The first next major effort on this was actually in California. It was part of the, uh, the PATH program, which was in, I think, bl I believe it was actually started in the early 80s or maybe even earlier. Uh, one phase of the PATH program actually looked at, um, again, putting similar kind of a structure, which is um, coils in, in the roadway and then having a, s a pair of coils in the vehicle and trying to en transfer energy. Uh, what they ended up realizing was that this thing was not at all energy efficient, was too expensive, and it just didn't actually work out in a practical sense. So nothing really came out of all of this, except that people had been thinking about it and they were trying. Now, around the same time, up out in New Zealand, there was a group um, of boys in green who actually did use this technology and were able to commercialize this technology, but not in roadway traffic or any other kind of transportation system, but in factory automation. So in factories, you still need to have things that move around um, and, and um, carry goods from one place to another. And their work in essentially the same kind of technology, but the big difference being that the gaps that we were talking about through which the energy had to transfer was much smaller because here, this was in a controlled environment. You, your clearances could be in millimeter, millimeters instead of um, tens of centimeters or so. You were able to more efficiently deliver energy. And so this technology actually did take off. It was commercialized and a number of companies, especially led by companies out of Japan, uh, have basically deployed these systems in various uh, factory settings. So none of that would have probably changed our lives, except a professor out of the applied physics or physics department at MIT took what I guess other people had thought of as mundane technology and really 
put it on top burner by popularizing it as, uh, to some extent, uh, making it seem magical, um, similar to how Tesla probably uh, made it look magical. It wasn't magic. I mean, if you go down and you sort of read their papers and you look at what they're doing, it's essentially the same technology. They're, the distance that they were covering was larger. Um, but what they had available to them were devices and electronics that could now operate at much higher frequencies. And by sort of leveraging that and uh, doing clever designs, they were able to basically deliver energy across a larger distance. And they demonstrated something that was a couple of meters across, and they were able to light a light bulb, which was 60 watts at that distance. This really brought it back into the limelight and uh, spurred venture capital money being thrown at this problem with the same uh, folks starting a company by the name of Vitricity, which you probably all heard of, uh, which essentially tried to take this back into the automotive world. So in the automotive space, this technology has essentially taken uh, two um, sort of two directions. One, which is uh, the stuff which seems much more realistic and more short term is what's called stationary wireless charging. So this is where you come home, you park in your garage, and the car automatically starts charging. Um, and if you've forgotten to plug it in, the next morning you come back, you still have a charged battery and you're not stuck at home. Uh, so it seems like this would be a no-brainer, but even today, uh, even the stationary wireless charging is coming only as a aftermarket product. So it hasn't really made it to where you can go and buy a Mercedes with a built-in system. There have been a little, uh, a few sort of uh, experimental um, or pilot type of projects, but that's essentially where this technology is. The more out of this world kind of technology is dynamic wireless charging, and that's what I'm going to focus on, which is where you're actually not delivering energy to the vehicle as it's driving down the road. All right. So how does it work? So I have kind of hinted at it. It's essentially a loosely coupled transformer. Uh, so you've got a coil in the roadway. You have a paired coil in the vehicle. As the vehicle goes over these pairings, you have magnetic flux, um, which is coupling across. Um, and you're basically picking up, a, as long as you have uh, time-varying um, magnetic fields, you'll induce a voltage on the other side on the coil, and that is able to deliver you the energy that you need to charge your battery. And if you can get enough energy, that could not essentially be enough to propel you as well. So you don't then need as much battery, or you could completely eliminate the battery as long as you're going to be always on this track, which has this capability. Uh, here's a sort of an actual system that you can see. This is from Oak Ridge National Labs, who were one of sort of the pioneers in the US in sort of bringing this technology along with sort of Vitricity was essentially uh, not making products, but they had designs and they were trying to sell them to companies like Toyota. Oak Ridge was actually building the products in the US and has been sort of uh, giving these um, as essentially demonstration things to companies like um, uh, so uh, U.S. Post and things of that sort. Now, in terms of the state of art of this stuff, um, as I mentioned, there's the systems that have been developed at Oak Ridge. So Oak Ridge has built quite a few stationary systems. They've also delved a little bit with sort of uh, the dynamic charging. So here's one of their demonstration uh, systems that they built a few years ago. So you have just a series of the same kind of charging pads, um, and the vehicle as it drives over would pick up the charge. Um, here's sort of a artist's rendering of the Vitricity system. And then the most um, sort of state of the art in this is a system that was uh, built by Qualcomm a year and a half or so ago. And this is based on technology that was actually developed on top of the New Zealand uh, technology that had been developed originally for uh, factory automation. Uh, this is today the longest single track for dynamic wireless charging. It's uh, I believe it's 100 meters, but it might be a little longer than 100 meters. Um, and it can have uh, up to, uh, or they've tested it with up to two vehicles on it at a time, and it delivers up to 20 kilowatts of energy to those vehicles. All right. So all of that is very nice. Um, there seems to be sort of a linear um, trajectory of this technology. 
what are sort of the bottlenecks? Uh, well, a few bottlenecks um, are related to the fact that magnetic fields, and in fact, I would say that is one of the biggest um, hindrances of magnetic-based systems, is magnetic fields inherently close on themselves. So if you have a loop and you create magnetic fields, the magnetic fields will go out and come wrap back the, on themselves. So what that means is if you have a system on the ground and then a system in the vehicle and the magnetic fields have to go up, if you don't have a mechanism to shield the passenger compartment, those magnetic fields are going to enter the passenger compartment and they're gonna interact with your body. And that can be uh, not a pleasant experience and it's certainly not a healthy experience. So what all companies do is they put what are called ferrites, which are essentially materials which have a higher uh, permeability for magnetic fields. So magnetic fields prefer going through those pathways and then they sort of wrap around and come back in back into the uh, ferrite that is underneath the uh, roadway. Now these ferrites are ceramic materials, so they tend to be fragile. They're also lossy materials. And one basic principle of sort of these systems is that if you can operate the magnetic field at a high frequency, that means they're oscillating at a higher frequency, then you can generate a higher voltage uh, even with a smaller sized coil. So if you want to reduce the size and not sort of take up the entire vehicle or need space more than what's underneath the vehicle, you really want to run these at high frequencies. But since ferrites are lossy, um, you can't really exceed a certain <coughs> frequency and typically these systems are uh, built with frequencies under 100 kilohertz. Um, the other thing which I mentioned is that they are fragile, which means if you put them into the roadway, then just because from a, uh, thermal expansion and contraction, they will crack. If you have heavy truck uh, traffic going over the roadway, they will tend to crack. Um, and the ferrites are not cheap either. So it's a, it's a fairly expensive system and it has all of these uh, limitations. Not to mention now you're putting these ferrites which are going to take volume and add weight to the vehicle side as well. So what I'm going to be talking about is actually a system that doesn't use magnetic fields at all. Uh, and that's based on the other field that we know about, which is the electric field. Uh, now, this would essentially, in theory, work as follows, that you would have two plates or two metallic plates uh, on the vehicle, two metallic plates on the roadway. And essentially, you are exciting these at high frequencies and you're sending displacement currents from one plate to the vehicle, it'll charge up the battery, and then the displacement current returns back through the other pair plate. Uh, that create, uh, closes the circuit. The advantage here is that electric fields start at positive charges and end at negative charges, so there is no need for, or the electric fields are not going to go into the passenger compartment, so that you've got a self-sheeting system, so you don't need to put any shielding behind it. Um, Secondly, because you have none of that ferrite type material or any other dielectric material to contain the fields, you can operate this at much higher frequencies. And when you operate at much higher frequencies, you can shrink the size of the system. Furthermore, it's a much simpler system, so it's a lot cheaper, and it's much easier to embed in, in roadways. So you would say, well, that's a no-brainer. Why didn't everybody else do this? The reason is nature made magnetic fields far superior to electric fields in terms of their ability to transfer energy for a given frequency. <coughs> right? What that means is that there are two universal <coughs> constants. One is called mu naught, which is the permeability of free space. The other is epsilon naught, which is the permeativity of free space. The permeability, which is the one that goes with magnetic fields, is five orders of magnitude greater than the permeativity of free space. And so if I want to generate the same amount of effective power transfer with electric fields, I essentially need five orders of magnitude higher voltage compared to the amount of current that I would need for magnetic fields, right? So they're kind of duals of one another. One runs off voltages, the other runs off currents. So, but the one thing, and so essentially at the, once people realize that, although nobody actually quite explicitly said, said it in those words, people tried it earlier on, and they're realizing that it doesn't really work, they completely rot, wrote it off. The one thing that people forget is that if you can, so this is all equal if you were operating at the same frequency. 
But now if you can somehow go to five orders of magnitude higher frequency, you can essentially compensate for that difference. Actually, you don't even have to do that because you can deal with 100 volts much more easily than you can deal with 100 amps. So if you can have 10 amps, you can certainly have 100 volts. So you really only have to bridge a 10 to the or, or orders of magnitude of four difference between the two. So as I was mentioning, the conventional wisdom in this area was that this is a technology that would never work because, or capacitive charging as it's called would never work except for some really tiny applications like cell phone charging where you essentially have no gap. You can just put the device on the pad itself uh, and you can charge it at like a five watts kind of levels rather than 20 kilowatts kind of level. Uh, there was some early work in Japan done trying to get the energy through the tires because the tires come closest to the road. Unfortunately, the tires don't provide enough surface area for you to actually transfer reasonable or any appreciable amount of energy. And you have a lot of losses in the tires because the tires are actually full of carbon black, which is highly dissipative. All right. So I have started to look at this whole area in 2014, almost five years after sort of the, the hype had already kind of uh, been created. Uh, and I had a undergraduate student just kind of play with this to see if we could bridge this gap by just going up in frequency. So we built a little prototype where we, all we were trying to do was go across half a centimeter and that was five, or five times bigger distance than anybody else had done successfully. The, the record at that time was one millimeter and 50 watts. So we went at, uh, at a frequency of one megahertz and we were able to deliver over 100 watts with reasonable efficiencies um, using a little toy experiment. And then we had a little uh, senior project design team actually build a little toy car. Lucky for us, uh, we were able to leverage this and write a half a million dollar grant proposal to ARPA-E and they thought it was crazy enough for their ideas program to fund it. And they gave us 18 months to demonstrate that this could be done at scale, which meant at least at one kilowatts with 90% efficiency across the air gap of a model Tesla Model 3, which is 12 centimeters, and while meeting safety standards. So that was the challenge that we were faced with. Uh, this was um, around 2016, and so we, sort of um, had written the proposal. We had sort of back of the envelope concept that might work, but it was kind of might work. And so off we went to really kind of look at the problem and see if we could um, address what the inherent problems were and see if we could solve them. So first of all, um, we have to cross a barrier um, of the air gap, which even if we had uh, so, so another target I didn't mention was that we had to do this at 50 kilowatts per meter square for the RPIE goal. So which basically meant that um, if we had a meter, we would need to deliver 50 kilowatts through it, through it. So our target was a uh, one kilowatt system. So we had proportionately less area. So what it meant was we had to deliver uh, one kilowatts through six picofarads of capacitance, which is tiny, right? So, so it was a huge amount of reactants that across which we had to deliver this energy, which meant that one, we had to really go at very high frequencies. Two, we had to boost our voltages up to a fairly high levels in order to make this happen. So we uh, kind of started to work on it and we had to meet the safety levels, which are actually set by ICNUP, which is uh, the body which sets these field limits is also the same body that sets the field limits for MRI type of equipment. So the first thing we needed was a, um, a system that provided voltage gain. So essentially we come off a DC voltage. We invert that into a high frequency using an inverter. Uh, this voltage is still at a few hundred volts because our DC voltage would essentially come off the line and get rectified. So it'd be a few hundred volts. Then you have to boost this up it to, into the kilovolts level uh, and then transfer the energy and then sort of convert this back into the voltage levels needed for a battery. Now, one of the challenges here was that because we had to meet these field safety levels, we could not allow the voltage that was appearing between the ground and the vehicle to be very high. 
because that's the one that's actually going to create the electric fields to which a human being standing next to the vehicle might be exposed. So that really meant that this displacement current had to be tiny, uh, which then meant to deliver the same amount of power, this voltage, which is on say one side or just on the roadway side had to be really high. So we really needed a network that could take the hundreds of volts and transfer them into sort of thousands of volts. At the same time, this network had to provide compensation, which means this is a highly capacitive network, which means that uh, you wouldn't be able to deliver much energy or real energy, because it will all be circulating energy, unless you were able to compensate it with an equivalent inductance, which would allow you to then actually deliver real power across the system. So uh, I will try and keep the math and the sort of the uh, really hardcore power electronics aspects of it to a minimum, but I'll give you a, just a flavor of, of the sort of uh, work we did that allowed um, us to proceed forward. Uh, the, the typical way, the way you would generate a high voltage or at least one uh, way to do that at uh, fixed frequencies is to basically utilize what are known as matching networks. Now, the art of matching networks has predominantly been developed for RF engineering, where people are sort of trying to match antennas to uh, power amplifiers. Uh, and so there, the focus has really been on things that were relatively different from the ones that we wanted to focus on, which was getting this done very efficiently. So we took a completely new look at the design of these matching networks uh, and set up sort of the problem as an optimization problem, to figure out what is the best way to design these matching networks in order to be the most efficient that they could be. Uh, and so I'm going to just kind of summarize in a few slides the results of, of this analysis because those results essentially changed what was conventional thinking. The conventional thinking, let me just point that out, was that if you have a large reactance, what you want to do is you want to compensate it from the very first stage closest to it on either side. And that makes sense from a conventional thinking perspective because that's where your currents are the smallest. So if you're putting in large inductor, that inductor is carrying the smallest amount of current, so it's best to do it really up front. Uh, so, so that was one thing that we discovered is actually not, uh, not exactly true. Uh, but sort of broadly, the few lessons that we learned, one was related to sort of how you distribute uh, the gain a network provides uh, versus the compensation it provides. Since you have a network that can be on the primary side and a network on the secondary side, the lesson to sort of to take away was that uh, depending on the voltage that you had on your input relative to the battery voltage, there's a certain amount of the gain that this system overall needs to provide because in the end, you're either stepping up the voltage or you're stepping down the voltage end to end. Now, depending on whether you're going up or down in voltage, each of these networks is either going to provide a voltage gain or it's going or a voltage step up or a voltage step down. And if it is providing a large voltage gain, then what you want from that network is as little compensation as possible. So essentially, this really, in a summary, it says that if, if this is going to provide high gain, then make this a low compensating network and then make most of your compensation on the other side. Right. The next question was, well, each of those networks on the, on the primary and the secondary side could potentially have multiple uh, stages and what, how should you distribute, again, the compensation and gain between these stages? The conventional thought, as I mentioned, was to put all the compensation close by and make the gain equal for, uh, and really use the rest to provide gain and provide equal gain from all of those stages. Well, it turns out that actually it's better to distribute that compensation across. There's a very specific way in which you want to distribute that compensation and also the way you distribute the, the gain is in a sort of, it is roughly what you would think that most of your stages are providing equal gain, but it's not exactly true because your last stage actually becomes non-realizable if you're still providing the same amount of gain that you're providing from the first few stages. So what it tries to do is essentially get the maximum gain that you can get from this 
uh, closest stage in while the system is still realizable. By realizable means that when you pick the values of L and C's, they don't come out to be negative or something like that. And then you take the rest of the gain and you pr distribute that equally from the other stages. So these were sort of non-conventional results uh, which we were able to discover and it um, allowed us to kind of uh, achieve efficiencies that were uh, higher than what you would otherwise be able to. The, the next question to ask was, well, how many stages do you put in, in on either side? Uh, and it turns out that you can, as long as you're putting more stages on both sides, you can keep increasing the number of stages and the system starts getting more and more efficient. Uh, that was also non-conventional thinking because earlier work had shown that there is an optimum level um, and not in this context, early, the earlier work was again in the context of mostly antennas, that there is an optimum number of, um, of stages that you should have. Here what we discovered was that the optimum number uh, is not there as long as you are sort of adding stages on both sides. But if you have a limit on the number of stages on one side, then there is an optimal number of uh, stages on, for the other side. Uh, in, in, in general, you can just keep adding stages and your efficiency goes, keeps going up. However, it starts to saturate at some point, so there's no real benefit of going to an extremely large number of stages. And we were able to sort of come up with sort of analytical uh, limits on what these efficiencies would be. Uh, the end result of all of this was that the approach that we took and our, our uh, methodology allowed us now to build systems which were significantly more efficient than what the conventional approach would have allowed. And more importantly, they, were allow they allowed us to build these systems more efficiently at low vo air gap voltages, which is where you want to operate if you want the fringing fields to be low and the system to be safe. So we really want to operate with air gap voltages which are sort of around a kilovolt or less uh, so that your electric fields that are then being generated are also lower uh, and that is where you get a huge amount of benefit using this design approach. Uh, so this work we uh, validated again at small scale first to show that what we were sort of uh, showing in theory was actually true in practice and, and it was. Um, we built systems that using our approach as well as the conventional approach and demonstrated that in practice this was true. Uh, so now that we know how to build these matching networks which are efficient, uh, I'm not going to talk much about the design of the inverters. There's, there's a lot that can be said there as well, uh, but um, the inverter design that we are using is essentially a H-bridge kind of an inverter, so it's, it's a fairly standard design. Uh, the next piece of the work was to go back and try and now build the system and see if it would work. So if you take the environment in which we're building this, so we've got the road, we've got a couple of plates on the road, a uh, couple of plates on the, on the vehicle chassis side. Uh, we've got some capacitance between these things and our goal was to basically have our matching network would connect here to these plates, another one on that side and you would feed the energy through this. It'll go through these plates nicely and get to the chassis. Except when we actually built our first sort of little prototype, we got no energy across, nothing, zip, zero. Uh, maybe uh, like a few millivolt watts if we were being generous with the noise that we were picking up. Uh, and the reason was then when you go back and you look at this uh, system and you're kind of thinking of it, well, we've got high enough frequency, we've got all the impedance matching to compensate for these plate capacitances and it should really work and it's not, and it's because of that. Because while, yes, you can kind of squint and imagine that's the only capacitance, that's not. There's like huge amount of capacitance from anything to anywhere. Like this capacitance between me and all of those chairs and this capacitance between me and the moon and between me and the end of the universe and it's all finite capacitance. Uh, and in this case, actually these capacitances were, were bigger than the capacitance through which I wanted to send energy. So if I am now energizing this side, well the energy just swashes, goes up here, goes down there, comes back and it's nicely circulating on one side of the roadway. Nothing's getting across. So 
So we were essentially stumped at this point. We were like four months into the project. ARPA is on our heads. We're writing our quarterly reports, and we have zip to show, um, except for lots of theoretical papers, uh, winning uh, best paper prizes, but essentially useless from a practical perspective, uh, which is exactly what sort of we, we scientists do many times. Uh, so then we had to kind of go back and put this back into our, our circuit. So here's the, the inverter, right? So he, he, here's our nice little inverter that's I said, so an H bridge. Um, this was the inductor that was gonna compensate. And we kept the system simple. So this, even though we had done the theory for these N uh, stage uh, matching network, we said, well, okay, we, we, we can't even get like one milliwatt of energy transfer through the system forget about all that matching network, let's just put one inductor in and let's try and get something to work. All right, so if you look at that capacitance network, it actually looks this complicated. Uh, and if you look at, you simulate this, what you'll see is that essentially these two capacitances that are connect, taking um, essentially the, th this is the, the road, um, or this node represents the, the road itself, and there's a capacitance from that road to the ground of the inverter. Essentially, you're trying to pump energy and it's just coming through here, it's coming through here, it's coming back through this capacitor and completing the loop. And as, as long as you don't have zero uh, capacitance, as long as that capacitance has some value, well, you just suck that energy out. So nothing gets across. And then anything that does get across, well, this second capacitance then sucks it out there. Right? So, and you can't, eliminate this capacitance because obviously your whatever circuit you're gonna build is gonna sit in the road and there's gonna be capacitance from there to the road, all right? So you then scratch your head and try and figure out um, what to do. Well, I should say that we really scratched our heads and what we figured out was the one principle of physics that we had not used yet was symmetry. And I can never sort of highlight how important symmetry can be in not only helping you find fundamental laws of physics, but also taking fundamental laws of physics and applying them to real world problems. So we took that inductor and we just split it into two half inductors. And then our simulations showed that it didn't really matter what that capacitance was, we could get right across. And I'll explain why. So if we go back, so essentially what it does is you take that inductor, you split it, and it's as if those capacitances don't exist. Well, let me just explain. All right, so the thing is, the capacitances exist between this road and this um, node, and that they're sort of your t sort of worst nightmares. And from the vehicle uh, back to wherever the sort of this, the ground is for the battery and, and essentially where your, uh, everything is referenced to. Now, if you have equal split inductances, then because you're generating an AC voltage here, the, by symmetry, the voltages on these sides are always the negative of the other. So if this is plus X, this is minus X. And by symmetry, essentially, then this is zero. And if that's zero, again, also from symmetry on the other side, this is zero as well. So that basically means that between this zero and that node, there is no voltage. It doesn't really matter that I have capacitance there. If I have no voltage across it, I'm not gonna drive any current through it. And similarly, th this capacitance, it doesn't really matter now because I have zero volts here and zero volts here. Now in practice, it'll be hard to make them exactly the same. So you may have a few volts across it, but that's still nothing compared to the thousands of volts that you were dealing with initially. And these are small pico, pico farad level capacitances. So we eliminate essentially these three capacitances and essentially are left with that. That's still pretty ugly to work with. So what do we do? Well, we go back and we use symmetry again. So if you look at these two capacitances, these two capacitances coming to a, a point, but they're coming from, again, voltages which were x and minus x. So whatever current is coming down this path, because it's coming from x to zero, is exactly the same except in opposite direction from the current that's coming from here to that, which essentially means that the current that's coming from here, from top to bottom, is essentially flowing down here. If it's that 
it's what it's doing, then that node can be disconnected from there and you can put that capacitance here. You can do the same for this guy and you can move that there. And now you can start to combine these capacitances into sort of lumped capacitances and you can all merge this stuff here. That just leaves you these diagonal capacitances and those diagonal capacitances, you can look at this system and do effectively what's called an equivalent Thevenin equivalent, uh, except it's a two port Thevenin. And what it does is its effect is as if you had reduced the main capacitance by, the by that diagonal capacitance because it's essentially sucking current out from where it would have otherwise gone and it's added some capacitance to this. So now we actually have a system that looks exactly like what we wanted. This is what we were hoping that our system would look like because these were the capacitances that we wanted to deliver energy across and these capacitances are essentially capacitances that would have been part of our matching network. In fact, we can absorb them into our matching network and not put a matching network capacitance at all. So in our actual system, we're not going to have any capacitances on board. We're just gonna use these parasitics to essentially create the matching network itself and essentially just have these half inductors. So with that, we were successful. And I'm cutting the story short because we built three generations of systems. Our first generation system only produced 146 watts, but that was still zillion times percent higher than the milliwatts of power we initially had. Um, and then the next generation system was even higher and we hit our target of over a kilowatts with our third gen system. And we uh, nicked the 90% mark and our PAE allowed us to pass uh, with that performance and we broke the 50 kilowatts per meter square target as well. So in the end, we were successful. Um, our PAE project ended, but we had other funding by that time, so we continued to uh, keep going. So our next thing was, well, how do we push this even higher? Because one kilowatts is great, and I'm gonna accelerate because um, to kind of just finish on time. But so we went back and we looked at where our losses were our biggest loss mechanism was in the losses in our inductors. So we focused on making these inductors better. Uh, the first um, thing we did was we increased our frequency. So I missed to mention that this systems that we built were 6.78 megahertz. The choice of frequency was basically driven by the fact that 6.78 is one of the lowest frequencies for a, the industrial scientific and medical band, which is a frequency band in which FCC allows you to operate uh, non-licensed uh, things. Uh, but by jumping to the next band, which is at 13.56, we were able to reduce the size of these inductors. It goes by, uh, so you double the frequencies, you get a benefit of a factor of four. Uh, and then we optimized it further to where our current inductor actually looks like this and both of these inductors are actually on the same core. The, it's an air core inductor, so it really doesn't have any magnetic material. Uh, it's just on a, uh, a plumbing PVC pipe. Um, and by sort of putting both inductors on the same core, we are able to leverage the mutual magnetic coupling between them to actually make it look bigger than it actually is. So uh, we were able to sort of work on these uh, inductors and get their efficiencies up. The QL is essentially a metric for measuring uh, the quality factor or the efficiency of the inductor. And we got them up to 2000, uh, uh, a factor uh, to a value of 2000, uh, which as inductors goes is, is actually very high. Uh, and we were able to most recently build a system which is at 3.75, uh, kilowatts um, and is efficiencies are um, in the 95% range <coughs> and still has the power transfer density that uh, sort of we've been targeting. So this is sort of the main theme of what I wanted to talk about. I'll just show you a few other sort of ancillary things we've been, we worked on uh, along the way. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the important aspects is to reduce the fringing fields. Uh, the SAE has a, has, a, uh, has a proposed standard for that where they want you to limit the fields outside the region where you're actually transferring power. Uh, and we proposed a method of doing that by, uh, first of all, obviously, our basic design does that, but uh, to further improve safety, what you can do is have multiple such modules. You can phase shift those modules so as to do actually field cancellation. Uh, 
So we were able to demonstrate this field cancellation where a single module produced this blue level of field. So you were able to, this is sort of right underneath where we're transferring power to uh, where you are 60 centimeters away. Uh, by the time you get to, uh, if you double the power uh, by adding two modules, you'll double the fields. But if you run them in anti-phase, you'll cut those fields and you'll make it even more safe. So you get down to sort of this green line. Now, the challenge so far I've shown you was predominantly for things that were stationary, right? So there was nothing about moving. So what happens when things move? Well, when they're moving, this whole system, which is essentially a resonant system because your inductance has to match the capacitance precisely, is no longer going to stay in resonance if you move. Uh, also, if you have a vehicle which has a higher clearance, you need that to be matched as well. So to enable that, what we developed was um, a, an architecture whereby we can continuously meet this matching requirement without having to change frequency, which is sort of the alternate way to do that, but we wanted to stay within these ISM bands. And so we were able to uh, deliver uh, co continuous power as we moved by sort of changing the voltages on, on this network. Uh, and this is one of our sort of dynamic charging prototype where we can actually move this vehicle across and we can maintain full power even though we are misaligned. Uh, and we can also maintain full power even though we have a vehicle with a uh, higher height clearance. So we can sort of control this. And, and we built this both in uh, systems where you're essentially doing this automatically. Um, so I won't go through sort of the math of this, but essentially rather than trying to measure these very high frequencies, we have control loops whereby we able to essentially uh, get this thing done uh, by measuring just the DC quantities, which are much easier to measure and are able to maintain sort of this. Finally, um, this is just sort of experimental demonstration of that. Finally, we've also studied how foreign objects affect this system. So if you have a piece of metal that comes in between or a piece of wood or water or, or salt water, and what it turns out is that uh, most objects actually don't affect the system. Water does. Any material which has a dielectric constant other than air would affect it. Uh, and it acts as a detuning mechanism, but you can again bring that system back in tuning through this approach that we talked about earlier. This is just demonstrating that you're not heating up anything even though you've got water in there. Uh, it's essentially just a uh, detuning effect and you can either change the frequency slightly to retune it or you can um, change that network that I talked about where you are able to control the impedance match. The open question, and I'll leave you with this, is how do you actually put this in the roadway? This is a problem that is completely unresolved. Uh, it is a huge infrastructure effort for sure. Um, so whether this technology starts in sort of contained area uh, environments such as warehouses, factories, uh, docks, and uh, airports uh, is still open for sort of for uh, discussion and, and thought. Uh, but in the long run, if it is actually going to make it into sort of long distance uh, uh, travel, then it could potentially go into one of the lanes where initially things like long haul trucks may use it, um, especially uh, with trucks where you have to deliver megawatts level of power in order to sort of uh, propel them um, or sort of uh, or, or at least if you are going to stop and charge them, you'll need multi megawatts of power. So if, if for, so just to give you numbers, like a Model 3 would require you something like seven kilowatts of propulsion power. Um, so we're very close to that level with our 3.75 kilowatt system. Uh, but with trucks, you'd have to be sort of um, probably uh, 10 times higher than that. Uh, so this is still open and it's really for all the young, bright, uh, people in this room to, uh, as well as older bright people in this room to, <laughs> to figure out. Um, and, and clearly um, this whole uh, methodology could enable um, all these three things that we want. Uh, what's interesting is that these ideas have been around for a long time. I found this ad from 1960s, which essentially if you, if you really um, have really good eyesight, you can read. Uh, it really says that 
We, the, this is an ad by the electric utility industry which put out in the 60s because they were encouraging people to buy more of things that would use electricity. And they were saying, well, we're bringing this to light and we're bringing that to light. And they were also saying, well, we're gonna bring cars that will be driven electrically and propelled electrically. And essentially you, will, you can have a sort of a, a game of, I don't know, whatever they're playing. Um, while the car is driving itself autonomously. And this is sort of way back from like, I think 1963 or four or something like that. So people with great vision, I guess, have been around for a long time and we've all been kind of trying to get to this. Uh, we're still trying to get to that, but hopefully we will. I'll just kind of leave you with that. Um, these are our sponsors. Um, we've also had uh, some uh, additional, more recent uh, industrial sponsors. But this work that I presented is essentially done under ARPA E and NSF funding. I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, uh, Karib. I, I would describe that as an action adventure with a lot of big ups and downs. I fe felt I was on the edge of my seat, but ultimately a happy ending. So I think I'm going to side with Sally on the outlook for the uh, next 10 years or so. But it's easy for us to say. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, yeah, it's, it's actually, actually, time it's actually easy for me to say. It's, it's re it was really uh, the hard work was done by the graduate students. I should really acknowledge, apart from the funding agencies, it's the students who really put all-nighters and tried to figure out how this thing would actually work uh, that made it happen. Great. So uh, can we do a few questions? We have time for just a few questions. Any student questions back there? Relatively basic one. I want to know what kind of difference uh, in terms of the infrastructure you will need uh, when it comes to propelling maybe a long haul truck versus, say, a Tesla Model 3. Would there be a significant difference in the infrastructure that's needed? So the goal would be to actually put in infrastructure that is compatible with both. Um, so uh, most, com uh, most likely it will be a modular architecture. So, like each one of those pads would be able to deliver power that is more appropriate for say a medium sized vehicle. You could, you could power it at a lower power for a very small vehicle. But then if you had a semi or some big truck come by, you may actually need to power multiple of those things because I mean, you, especially if you can use the trailer that you have much more length available to you. So if you're powering say 10 of them, you'd get 10 times the power. Great. Other questions? Yeah. Um, since there are discussions where like uh, electric vehicles can also be used as storage facilities to yeah, balance out um, the grid, would your research allow cars to discharge as well? Yeah, so that's a very uh, interesting problem and it's much more of an optimization thing, which is to decide whether to have no batteries, some batteries, or a lot of batteries. And what um, essentially is the answer really, I think, uh, depends on somebody looking, taking a deeper look at that. Uh, I think the answer is going to be somewhere in the middle. So cars will still have batteries, um, but probably fewer. You would certainly still potentially be able to uh, pull energy out. In fact, uh, I'll give you a use case. So suppose you're on a, on a highway and you're accelerating. You may want to pull energy from a car that's decelerating at the same time and use it for your acceleration. So in addition to sort of uh, providing balancing or reactive control for the grid, you may even be able to just help roads, uh, cars that are sort of within a few miles of each other. One more question, anybody back there? Shanta. Uh, I'm wondering what the lifespan of your system is and how that compares to like the annual or however frequent um, road maintenance happens. So yes. if the roads are being torn up, Will that coincide with how often your system has to be replaced, or is there going to be some loss? Yeah, so roads are maintained, or ro when people build roads, they plan not to touch them again for about 20 years, roughly. Um, and so any system that's put in, that would be the requirement uh, from the road construction company's perspective, that essentially it goes in for 20 years and then stays there until the road is, has to be redone. Now roads, when I say roads are redone, there's always a continuous pave like surface finish that might happen in a more frequent sense. So this system would be buried below that. So it's not going to be right at the surface. So it might have a in, an inch or two inches of a surface coating on top, which 
may wear off and may get replaced at a more frequent uh, time scale than 20 years. Okay, I think we're just about out of time, so <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Karam on behalf of all of us one last time. Well, thank you. My pleasure.